Hello everyone and welcome to week six of our online writing class. I first want to begin uh, this week's materials with a brief discussion of your quizzes and your papers. As you know, you just completed your fifth quiz, which means you only have five more to go. We are roughly one-third of the way through the semester. Um, quiz 5's answer can be found on page 170, in which you will see a list of the seven deadly rhetorical fouls as they were. Um, the other part of your quiz question asked why, why do they muck up arguments or why are they important to avoid, as it were. And again, the thing that you want to remember is that you never want to argue the inarguable. The seven deadly rhetorical falls muck up arguments. In fact, they make them rather impossible to have. Um, certain uh, features such as threats, humiliation, and innuendo and the like seek to debase and humiliate people and precludes choice, which of course is at the heart of deliberative rhetoric. I also wanted to take a moment to note that some of you were concerned about your uh, quiz grades. Uh, that you weren't performing as highly as you expected to. Um, to which I reply, that how will I know if you ever have your books or your um, notes open while you are taking the quizzes? If you are not performing up to uh, par, as it were, um, make sure that you are going over your readings and your notes um, and that you understand what the question is asking you and how to indeed find that answer. Again, these are not meant to be gotcha quizzes or in any way hinder your grade. If anything, um, I was hoping that they would promote your grade as they are fairly simple and straightforward. So you may want to avail yourself of those options if you find that you are not performing the way you would like to. I'd also like to take a moment to address your papers. You have received your grades back for your first assignment, which was the advertisement analysis. Now, most of you did very well, but some of you missed the mark on a few key points, which I'd like to remind you of. I was surprised at the number of people who did not have creative titles for their papers. Again, advertisement analysis only tells me what the topic of your paper is. It doesn't say anything about the content. Um, it actually lacks creativity. You want to give me some insight as to what it is you will be talking about. Some of you also missed the mark on the summary versus analysis aspect of this assignment. Now remember, one of the features was to describe your commercial and what was involved in it. However, the crucial point that you needed to hit on was how these features act as persuasive devices. How and why were the key questions that you needed to answer in order to get the full points. Also, a number of you uh, were a bit off on your MLA formatting, from either the paper's structural formatting to introducing and citing quotations in MLA format. I did not take many points off this time around for lack of proper MLA citation, but please note that as the semester progresses, and especially when we get down to your final two assignments, it will be crucial that you use proper MLA. So go to the OWL at Purdue, the link which is under links in our course, and make sure that you have it open as you are formatting your papers. Again, this is nothing that needs to be memorized. And finally, um, I wanted to see a bit more insight in some of your conclusions. Perhaps in high school you were told that your conclusion was basically just a summary of everything that you had already written. Not so in university writing. Um, otherwise, if that were just a summary, what would make me want to read the rest of your paper? I could just look it up in, in the back of your paper and not have to look at any of the other content at all. Rather, your conclusion should offer me insight. That is, what, if anything, do you want your audience to take away from all that work that you put into writing your paper? I know that writing is difficult. Some of you have expressed your frustrations uh, with this course, either being out of practice or, you know, not really feeling like you're clicking on all cylinders with the requirements. A recent survey in the Chronicle of Higher Education noted that writing was one of the most difficult tasks that students were asked to do in their college and university experiences. But, like anything, to get really good at writing, you have to practice it. Um, and also, you have to sit with your thoughts and perhaps produce multiple drafts before you can come to a really good, a really good solid piece of work. Now, um, I am here 
to help you in any way that I can. I'm always available e via email. Um, I also have physical office hours on campus on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I can also chat with you via Google+, Skype, um, Wimba via Blackboard, um, and any other kind of way that you might feel that uh, you need to, to make sure that you are on the same page uh, with the assignments directives. So please avail yourselves of those options if you need to. Also, as a reminder, your definition assignment is due by 11.59 p.m. on Sunday, October 14th via the Safe, Assign, uh, Safe Assign link that is under this week's content. Um, again, the link will disappear at 11.59. Make sure that you allow yourself enough time to post via this link, as I will not accept your assignments via email or any other format. Give yourselves enough time. I can't stress this enough. As with most things in life, if you procrastinate, you will not get the results you wish for. Now on to this week's content. This week, we're going to be discussing the defensive side of ethos, which of course always starts with your audience's needs. What do they value? What do they desire? A good persuader makes you believe that he or she can meet those needs better than anyone else. This is, of course, all based, as the wonderful philosopher Billy Joel said, on a matter of trust. How do you display your trustworthiness? The first component to trustworthiness, as we've discussed before, is disinterest. This is the merger of your needs and the persuaders. Um, and it is really rarely far from the surface of choice. You're going to want to ask yourself, does the persuader appear to be the last one to benefit or perhaps even be hurt by the choices being presented? You'll want to look for the short circuits in the arguments examples, commonplaces, and choices. Of course, identifying logical sins or fallacies is one really great way to look for these short circuits, short circuits and identify them. The second component of trustworthiness is practical wisdom. Does the persuader, in this case you, exhibit common sense? Does the persuader have actual experience and perhaps share that experience through a comparable tale? Does the persuader use phrases like, that depends, or does he or she offer a one-size-fits-all model? Again, this world is very rarely black and white. There are many shades of gray, and anyone who offers you only one choice, well, I would be very suspicious if he or she really had your true interests in mind and the interests of the larger group. The third component of trustworthiness is virtue. This enhances your reputation as well as evaluates the character of another person. And coincidentally, or maybe perhaps not so coincidentally, is the password for this week's quiz with the capital V. Virtue, according to Aristotle, is a state of character concerned with choice, lying in a mean. Well, what does that mean exactly? Let's break it down. First of all, a state of character. Again, remember, we're talking rhetorical virtue here. It's not permanent, and it only exists in the argument itself. Be careful not to confuse rhetorical virtue with morality. Rhetorical virtue adapts to the audience's expectations and not to the persuader's. So, for example, if the audience believes you to be virtuous, then what you did in Las Vegas to disprove that belief does not necessarily matter, as long as your audience doesn't know what happened in Vegas. The second part of Aristotle's definition says that we should be concerned with choice if we are virtuous. Virtue comes out of the choices that the persuader makes or tries to sell you on. Prevention of choice through distraction or threats uh, many of those rhetorical falls that we discussed last week, is considered unvirtuous. You want to look for the arguments being made. Are they being told in the past, which has to do with blame, or the present, which has to do with values or right and wrong? And those are the moral values, by the way. You want to avoid making them at all costs. You want to stay in the future. That, of course, is the heart of deliberative argument. And finally, we have the last component of Aristotle's definition of virtue, lying in a mean. It is also known as that sweet spot, which is, again, at the heart of deliberative rhetoric. Mean in this instant means middle or moderate. A virtuous person is never one extreme or another, i.e., she or he is neither sanctimonious or a hellraiser, but could be fun on a, on a Saturday night. 
That is, maybe they're not at church or perhaps at the strip club, but perhaps, but on the other hand, maybe they're throwing a really nice intimate get together at their home. The meme lies smack in the middle of an audience's values and has the most appeal. So how do you test for virtue? How does the individual, or you for that matter, describe the mean of an argument? Oh my goodness, there's a typo there. Well, know that I know that it's a typo. <laughs> Extremists usually describe the middle course as extreme. You want to ask yourself, what are your special interests? How might they cloud your ability to be rhetorically virtue? Yes. Um, and of course, in the immortal words of the master rhetorician Ice Cube, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Have a great week, everybody, and again, if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Catch you on the flip side.